Well, thank you. And so my follow-up question, what's wrong with the job market? I mean, what has been going on? 2011, 2012, average monthly gain in the job market, about 153,000. And this is well below a lot of previous recoveries. So how are you looking at the job? What is holding it back? So that's a, that is the great question that we're faced with that, um, you know, I think that the, the nature of the shock that we were hit with in 2008 uh, was a very significant one. And the, the way I think about that shock is that there were, um, Americans lost a great deal of wealth. They lost wealth because their home values fell. They lost wealth because equities fell. And they lost wealth because they lost their jobs. That's going to put a lot of, lot of, lot of downward pressure on demand. And uh, in the wake of that as well, I think there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty. You know, and I think that uncertainty shows up in the, 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 on the firm side by they're not sure what demand is going to look like as they try to recover. And on the household side, they're, uh, they, they, they are also worried about whether or not they're going to be facing unemployment or not. So all those sources of uncertainty, I think, are, are constraints that lead people to be, be conservative about spending now as opposed to, to as much as they, 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 they might otherwise. So all these downward pressures on demand are what's, I think, driving down unemployment. And I, I think also keeping inflation below uh, the, the, the Fed's target. Um, the, the, the offset to that, I think that you know, it's always the challenge in macroeconomics, both as an as a academic, which I was before, but as a policymaker now, as a communicator about macroeconomics, is that you don't, it's very hard to talk about the counterfactuals. That is, what would have happened if hey, we not done what we were doing? But I think I, I feel confident in saying that um, Unemployment is as low as it is, and employment growth is as high as it is, which is not as high as we'd like it to be because of the actions of, of the Federal Reserve. Now, one of the big debates thinking about the job market over the past five years is how much of the weak job market is structural. So companies have lots of software jobs, but its construction workers are available. Yeah. And how much of it is cyclical, that it, you know, if things that the, uh, what Keynes called the animal spirits of capitalism start really working, businesses will go out there and hire. And so where do you come down now on this? So that's a great question because certainly I, I, I somewhat publicly have been, been uh, thinking my way through that question about how, how structural the impediments are to hiring. And so I, I would, I, I, you know, I, and my, my thinking has been evolving on that. So, but let me talk about some of the, some of the evidence that you might, might, might uh, look at to, to bring to bear on that. Uh, you know, I, I think one of the things you have to be careful to be doing when you're thinking about that question is, is to be looking at what's going on in the microeconomics of job, of, of uh, hiring and, and, and firing and how that's, how that's behaving. And we've got a lot of work has been done in the Federal Reserve over the last two years on this question. And I think that kind of work has really, I, I think, come down on the idea that the, right now, so what's, uh, the level of what's structural seems to be relatively small. Now, um, so it's, there's still some of it out there. So what does that mean? So that means that if you look at the long-run unemployment rate that uh, the Fed was forecasting was going to be consistent with 2% um, uh, inflation, if you go back to 2007 and ask Fed policymakers what they thought unemployment rate would be over the long haul, they were about 5%, I think slightly under 5%. Um, and now it's the, those numbers range between 5.2 and 6%. So there's some elevation, but still well below the, the 7.8 yeah. that we're at right now. Um, the other piece of information that you can bring to bear, so I've, I've talked uh, at a high level about sort of the micro uh, econometric work that's been going on within the Federal Reserve System and in academia on this. Um, the other kind of evidence you can point to is what's going on with wages and what's going on with inflation. So if it were structural impediments that were keeping, um, keeping unemployment high, we should expect to see more wage growth than we see because firms would be bidding up the, the wages of the, 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 yeah. the few workers that they find acceptable and that would be showing up in prices as well. And as I just depicted, you're not seeing that. Now, what we have, what we have to be cautious about as policymakers is this is not a static picture. You can't give an answer to that question and say, okay, we're done. We can go home now. Because if we look at what happened in, in Europe in the 80s, there was changes in the level of the unemployment that ended up being structural. And it, you know, the longer we have un the unemployment as high as we have, 
the more danger I think we have that 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 that, that, that coming to fruition. But right now, I would say my my my. Uh, my, you know, my estimate is in that range of 5.2 to 6 percent of uh, the long-run unemployment rate, consistent with 2 percent inflation. Now, there's a very uh, vocal group of economists, uh, people at think tanks in Washington, that would say, "Mariana, that's I mean, that's really good. Glad you're thinking about unemployment, jobs, the long-term unemployed, but that is not what the Fed should be worried about. It should be price stability. This dual mandate is a fundamental flaw." Yeah, no, I, I think that it's very important for us to keep in mind as, as Fed policymakers and for the public to keep in mind that we are um, created by Congress and what we do is, is um, tr seek to achieve as best we can the mandates that are, that are given to us by Congress. So the, the, the two mandates that have been given to us are are uh, max employment and price stability. So in, in some sense, if you have a concern about that, it's you know that's something for Congress to take. Right. With that said, so so that, that's the, my attitude as a policymaker. I, I actually think that um, the Fed's uh, actions right now would not be all that different if we only had the one mandate. Um, and I say that because inflation is running below our, uh, say, in the, next, in the medium term outlook for inflation is below 2%. That means that, um, you know, reducing accommodation now, tightening monetary policy would take you further away from your objective of trying to keep inflation um, from falling too far below 2%. You know, it's, it's very important to keep in mind that when you have a target, missing it from below is also bad. People are writing contracts with each other with the idea that they want to know what those dollars are going to be able to buy, and you don't want them missing too low or too high. So I, I actually think just from the right now, I think that it's a, I don't see a tension between the two mandates. They're both saying the same thing from the point of view of inflation is too low and unemployment is too high. The other comment I'll make about that is there's a number of countries that only have one mandate, but most of those central banks will keep an eye on the, econ on the economy as a whole. And I like the fact that the US Central Bank and the Congress of the US is, is open and honest about the fact that we are keeping track of both. I think right. that, I, I think most central banks end up doing it anyways. Mine was minus will be open about the fact that we're doing it. So let's stick with the uh, monetary policy theme. And this is a question from the audience. And do you think the Fed's low interest rate policy is giving politicians less incentive to tackle long-term deficit problems by allowing the government to continue to borrow cheaply at abnormally low rates. So the question that uh, comes up a lot. Um, so right now, uh, interest rates for the U.S. for U.S. Uh, Treasuries are very low um, by by historical standards. Uh, both the uh, so-called nominal rates, the, the rates you usually read about in the paper, but also real rates, which are adjusted for. Uh, inflation expectations. And the way you can do that uh, for the presence of inflation, if you look at the yields being paid by Treasury inflation protected securities, one, uh, tr uh, bonds issued by the Treasuries that are, that are protected against inflation, those yields are also very low. And they're low going way out in the yield curve, going out 20, 30 years, well beyond, I would say, sort of the, the scope of what people are thinking about in terms of what the Fed is doing, frankly. And why is that? Why are interest rates so far low, so low, going out 20 and 30 years? It's because of the fact that um, I, I talked earlier about the uncertainties that people face. There's a number of uncertainties in the world. People are nervous about the future. They're nervous about a recurrence of, of, of the events of 2008. Uh, and the supply, uh, so they want to have safe things to, to, to put their wealth in. And the supply of the assets out there in the world that they consider as being safe is, is not as great as it was in 2007. Um, a bunch of, you know, a lot of sovereign debt, which seems safe in 2007, doesn't seem as safe anymore. Residential real estate in the United States seemed very, I think the expression is safe as houses, seemed very safe in 2007. Not, not so much anymore. So the supply of safety has shrunk and the demand for safety has gone up. And one of the things that people perceive as being safe U.S. Treasuries. And I, I think that the reason for that is that, this, that, that there, are, there is a fiscal uh, issue in the United States, that is there is a tension between um, our longer term obligations uh, to our older citizens especially. Uh, you think about um, Medicare and Social Security. 
Um, more of us are going get, to be getting older, uh, getting those payments, and there are going to be a smaller group of younger people working to, to, to support those payments. And that's a structural imbalance that, can, that has to be solved either by reducing those obligations or, or raising taxes. But I think what the markets perceive is that the conversation in the United States has started already about a problem that really is only going to be manifest in 10 to 20 years. There's already a discussion going on about that, a very serious political discussion about that. That shows the market's right. They, uh, they are willing to pay a lot for U.S. Uh, uh, treasuries because they are a great source of safety. And it's because the American taxpayer is responsible while paying, paying their bills. So one of the shorter term prices that's being paid for this low interest rate policy, um, elderly households that are more reliant on savings, they're not making much money there, which leads to, uh, as part of, I think, the uh, our next uh, question from the audience, more economists are calling the continued uh, low interest rate policy counterproductive. I mean, why do you think this is a good idea? You know, I, the, the, there's just a basic economic mechanism that I, I mentioned um, in my remarks. I think it's a very powerful one that when we keep interest rates low, it provides an ins it makes goods today cheaper relative to to goods in the future because the fact that. Um, Putting your money away to, to try to build towards the future is, is hard. And that's what, it, what does that make people do on the margin? It makes them spend more. But that's, that's one mechanism. That's the broad mechanism. It works through a number of channels. It pushes upwards on asset prices, like equities uh, and, 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 and real estate. Um, it makes it cheaper for people to borrow. So there's a whole range of mechanisms that are at work. Now, the, the point that you pointed to is certainly a mitigant against what I was talking about. It, 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 it offsets, to a certain extent, the forces I'm talking about, that um, a, a fraction of the population that's focused on saving uh, has less income. And that means, that's going to mean that monetary policy is not as effective as it might otherwise be if, if uh, everyone was borrowing. Right. But it's all told, uh, monetary, keeping interest rates low is still better than raising at this point. Um, and, you know, and that's that's just uh, you, you have to take do a lot of analysis to, to to make sure of that. But there are so many channels, so many mechanisms at work to that mean that low interest rates are stimulating um, demand, thereby stimulating employment and prices. Now that that's keeping them lower is the right thing to be doing at this stage. Okay, so you mentioned fiscal policy. So let's make a little leap to uh, fiscal policy. And one of the questions that a lot of people are asking, and it's on all the. Uh, op-ed pages, Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, Business Week. I mean, is there any way for this economy or an economy to recover without further deficit spending? So uh, let me talk about that question. I mean, I, I, you, when we, we do monetary policy, when I make a forecast like this, I have to put together some picture of what's going on with fiscal policy. So. What I mean by fiscal policy is the choices of taxes and spending that the that the the Congress and the President are making. It's really outside of our hands. So right, it's the world you live in. Though. It's a world I live in, absolutely. Yeah. And so I have to make forecasts about that. And you know, my baseline forecast does not depend on any deficit spending taking place. It's basically taking taking is is given what what I think is going to be happening, and that's and what you see is we start seeing recovery. Okay, we're continuing to see. Uh, unemployment continue to fall and inflation coming back to our our target. So, can we can we um, can we uh, have a recovery? Yes. Now, you know, I think the point of that question is a, is a, a maybe a deeper one, which is, couldn't we speed up the process by by more stimulative spending? Right. And because a lot of people do argue, actually, do the spending now. Tighten up later on. That and there, there was definitely an argument along those lines that if you spend more now, cut more taxes now, that will be uh, good for the economy now, and, and it'll speed up this process. That you know, the, the 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 tension there is it's not free. I mean, eventually you have to pay for these, and so that that's 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 why you know that's why the people who do that's the choices involved in fiscal policy, and I'm you know I'm, I don't have to make those choices. That's up to someone else. But it's that's. You know the tension. The tension is that yes, I think you would speed up the recovery, but it would be an, uh, uh, it would push back against this premise I advanced earlier that boy the U.S. is really 
a safe place to buy their bonds. And so, and, and you know, that's what the fiscal policymakers have to struggle with is that exactly that tension. So, what's the mechanism? I mean, why does um, a lot of public debt? I mean, how does that have an effect on economic growth? Uh, well, so I'll take take an example of. Uh, a change that just took place in uh, in law from 2012 to 2013 is that um, the payroll tax, which had, uh, has gone up by two percentage points, and so that means that uh, most households, um, um, say virtually all households, are going to be having less money in their pockets as a result of that. They're going to spend less as a result, and by spending less, that means there's going to be firms going to say, "Boy, there's going to be less demand for my goods." They're going to go out and hire less, and as well, they're, they're, uh, the prices they're going to be charging for their goods will not be as high as they would be if, if there had been this demand. So it's basically a short, the short-term idea that there's more money in people's pockets, and so they're going to go out and spend it. Okay. So uh, the next question from the audience is, how much national debt can the U.S. accumulate before it becomes unsustainable? <laughs> well, this is another uh, good question. I mean, I, so right now... Um, we have to get, try to get down on the numbers. So the U.S. national debt right now is about $16 trillion, which is uh, about, uh, I would say, a, a little bit higher than one year's worth of gross domestic product. But with that said, um, that number is misleading, I think, because a, about a quarter of that is actually debt that's held by other branches of the government. So it's the government owing itself money. Okay? So it's... Really, the, the money outside of that, I, I would say it's really on the order of around 75% of one year's worth of GDP is what's being held by the public. And by the public, by the way, I should add, some of that is actually the Federal Reserve it is included in that number of debt held by the public as well. Okay. So with that said, you know, can, can the, can the, uh, the uh, U.S. sustain this? And the, the answer, this level of debt, I, I think we should feel comfortable with. Um, in terms of that question, I mean, it may not be that we we want to have that level of debt. That's a different question. But can we do it? Yes, I think we can. And the, the answer, it's not just me saying that. That's what financial markets are saying as well. I think it's, I think when we think about sustainability, we shouldn't be thinking about the level of debt right now. It's more we should be thinking about the tensions I pointed to earlier about the size of the working population we're going to be having in 10 to 20 years and the size of the people who are um, uh, going to be old enough not to be working anymore. The, uh, um, and and that, 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 that tension, that demographic tension between the size of the working age population, the size of the non-working age population, which really is introducing the, the structural problem in our physical situation. And it's, as I said, something that's going to come up 10 to 20 years down the road. That's I think where the conversation should be should be about. So let's make another leap and um, I want to talk a little bit about too big to fail. Now this has been a theme of the Minneapolis Fed for a long period of time. Uh, your predecessor uh, absolutely uh, talked a lot about it, wrote a book about it. You know, there's a lot of discussion. So we've gone through. You know, we have this global financial crisis. We have the Great Recession or the Great Repression, whatever you want to call it. Um, have we really solved the too big to fail? situation or five years from now, six years from now, as memories start to fade, as profits start to grow, as people sort of say, well, if that won't happen again, we could end up back where we were. Well, it's, uh, so let's talk about what too big a fail is about and, and, and offer some thoughts on that. I, you know, I, I think, so my predecessor, uh, as you mentioned, Gary Stern, um, uh, uh, along with my current head of supervision, Ron Feldman, wrote a book about Too Big to Fail. And what does Too Big to Fail refer to? It's the idea that some financial institutions are so large that for them to fail would actually put the whole economy at risk of, uh, of loss, large, lo large losses in output. And faced with that, um, governments are going to uh, feel tempted to step in to provide funds to prevent them from failing. Okay, so that's that's sort of the what we, the economists would call the ex post problem after they've gotten into trouble. But uh, Gary, uh, my predecessor, pointed to the fact that there's an ex ante problem as well before anyone gets into trouble, because this means that 
people who are lending to the banks are thinking, boy, there's this state of the world, there's this outcome in which the banks get into trouble, but they're still going to get money for that, so I don't have to worry about that risk of them getting into trouble when I lend them money. So this is the idea that um, too big to fail means there are some institutions that, um, uh, that, that uh, the, the uh, because their uh, failure would be such a problem for the, for the economy, for the U.S. economy, maybe even for the world economy, that um, uh, the governments would be forced, in fact, to provide them with funds to keep them alive. And then that means that the people who are lending to those financial institutions don't take into account the risks they're taking. And that encourages the financial institutions to actually take on too much risk. So that's a too big to fail problem. Now, have we, have we, have we, have we have made progress on that? So in, or in 2010, um, the U.S. Congress passed uh, the Dodd-Frank Act. It's very long, 800 pages long, um, but I think it, it made some uh, significant steps towards trying to address this problem. But I'll come back to your point about five or six years, because I think it is, that's an important one. I think, I think the Dodd-Frank Act uh, had two specific changes that were very important in terms of thinking about too big a fail. One is that um, it has now specified a council called the Financial Stability Oversight Council, of 10 regulators. And the goal of that council is to be overseeing the whole financial system and in terms of the interactions between the components of that financial system to be able to better identify who is systemically important, that is, who would put the system at risk. Once you identify that, once you realize it's an institution is systemically important in this way, you've got to watch them really carefully. You know, and that's the, the second premise of, Do of the Dodd-Frank Act is once you've specified some institution is systemically important, there's going to be a lot of supervision of what kinds of risks they're actually taking on. This is uh, the goal of Financial Stability Oversight Council is to uh, deal with the problem of the, the insurance company AIG that showed up in 2008 that had been taking a lot, lot, on a lot of risk, actually exposing a number of institutions to systemic risk without really anyone knowing about it until the sun, suddenly, I would say, in the first week of September of 2008. With the Financial Stability Oversight Council, that uh, problem is at, a, at least uh, mitigated and I, I, I hope will, will not take place anymore. The second thing that I think is even more interesting, which is the process of what's so-called living wills. And uh, these institutions that are designated as being systemically important are required to write um, a plan for their deaths. So that if that ever came to pass that they were, going, they were in, in danger of failing, there would be a way to take them apart so that their socially valuable functions could be done by some other institution and thereby you would not, you could liquidate those firms without having, um, putting the whole economy at risk. So this really is a very interesting idea because it gets really at the heart of the two big to fail problem we just talked about. That yeah. um, It really is trying to say, we can liquidate this firm, just like a restaurant goes out of business some, you know, all the time it happens and it, we don't worry about, boy, the whole macro economy is gonna fall apart. We're gonna try, uh, set up a, a plan for liquidating these institutions so that we can do it safely without putting on the whole macro economy at, at, work, at, at risk. But I think your, your point about five to six years is critical. Because all of these, you can write down anything you want in the laws. And it really comes down to a matter of attitudes and regulation and whether the people get um, thinking, boy, that was a long time ago. You know, those people made mistakes. We're not gonna make those same mistakes. And so there's a certain level of comfort, of safety that you feel after, I, I don't even, I personally don't think it would be five to six years, but maybe 10, 15, or 20. Right. And so there's this book, I, I know you've read this, but, but there's a great book by uh, Carmen Reinhart and Ken Rogoff, and it's called This Time is Different. <laughs> and it's, Four most dangerous words it, in the English it, language. Right. <laughs> Well, sometimes it's, the, the book is incomplete. Uh, uh, but anyway, so this time is different. It's sarcastic because whenever um, you, uh, uh, you they go through uh, 800 years of financial crises, and they're always marked by people saying, you know, housing prices are really going up really fast, but this time is different because there are good reasons why housing prices are going up really fast and they won't fall. Now, I would say the book is incomplete because 
I think there are times when people say this time is different. It turns out to be. Right. Yes. <laughs> but 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 with that said, I think I think we do. It's very you know we can sit here, you and I, and and we can all sit here and say, yeah, we're not going to make that mistake again. But 20 years from now, will we will will the uh, will people still feel the same? That's that's the hard part of it. So a related question: uh, bubbles. You know, bubbles are some of the most fascinating moments in financial history. The the South Sea bubble, the tulip mania, the roaring twenties, dot com, and then of course the housing market. And when we had the the housing boom and bust in the aftermath, there was a lot of call for the Federal Reserve to prick these bubbles before they could do real damage. So it's a little, it's slightly related to too big to fail. It's almost like another aspect of that policy. Uh, because up until, up I, uh, under the Greenspan era, and I think really for a long period of time, the attitude was, we don't really know what a bubble is until it bursts. So we, you know, if you look at, uh, in, in, in this region, farmland, we're really around the country, you know, farmland, there's a growing concern that farmland is a bubble. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, now, not every price that goes up is a bubble. And sometimes it's you see, people right. seem to act yeah. that way. But what is the Fed's attitude toward bubbles? I mean, can you stymie these things? Can you stop them so that when they burst, they just don't do this type of damage that we saw with the housing market? So I, let me t talk about that. I mean, I, I, I so the Fed has a lot of different responsibilities. You're, you're kind enough to talk about some of the things that, that, that I'm responsible for. But the system as a whole... Is responsible for a bunch of things, and I, and so, uh, but I'll, I'll mention two in particular: monetary policy and supervision and regulation. And when I think about uh, the issues associated with bubbles, now I, I often think that uh, I, I, have you spent all uh, twenty years in academia, more than twenty years in academia? Boy, we talk a lot about bubbles, and it's always about can we explain how high the prices are? That's really not. I've come away feeling that's not really the right question. It's really about. How risky do we think the prices are right now? That is, what is the risk of a fall in the price? So how would it spread through the system? Is it going to be concentrated in the equity market? Or is well, it going to go to the banking but, system? But it, I, 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 that's, you're, you're even getting further ahead where I okay, wanted to go, so. which is simply, what's the risk of a price fall? So, and, and when you look at agricultural prices right now, for example, they've come up really rapidly. I think it's reasonable for bankers, for supervisors of those banks, to be thinking, it may not happen, but there's some probability of them coming back down. Um, and the same was true in the mid-2000s with housing. I think we should have, you know, maybe they wouldn't have come down, but I think we should have been more um, uh, planning for the scenario in which right. that, that happens. Now, you, you hit upon exactly the right thing about where would these losses be concentrated? Would they be concentrated on debt holders or equity holders? And I, I think the thinking right now, and I... I think this thinking is evolving, but is that there is a real difference about whether or not these losses hit the equity market or they hit hit the, hit, hit um, um, the debt market. So, if, it, but you mentioned the dot com bubble, for example. Those losses were all, are all felt by shareholders, and that's different than when um, somebody has borrowed against their home. Then the 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 uh, that loss associated that at least the foreclosures it leads to all sorts of a host of other problems. So a, a, a uh, asset price increase, like the housing price increase, at least a lot of borrowing and lending, yeah. is different than one that's leading to an appreciation in stock prices. With that said, so where, where does that leave the Fed? I think it leaves the Fed, I would be very cautious about using monetary policy as a way to try to deal with uh, what we might think of as being untoward movements in asset prices. You just mentioned uh, uh, a little while ago how some people think we already have too many mandates. Now you're thinking of adding another one. I mean, um, I think I, I would be very cautious about that. I think that um, the right way, the right lesson, I, I think the right lesson from the mid-2000s is we, we should have been more cautious about this on the supervisory side. It's really, we should not have been, we should have been more thinking about, boy, here's the scenario. Maybe we even think it's really extreme. But are the banks really protected against that? And I think that would have been the right way to be planning. And I think that's the react. That's that's uh, what we hope to have set up through the Dodd Frank Act and these other kinds of changes. Okay. So another question uh, from the audience on on monetary policy. So 
It appears the Federal Reserve presidents have major concerns over the zero interest rate policy currently directed by Federal Reserve chairman. And what I want to focus on with this question, um, so what is your opinion that on the long-term pressure this policy is going to have on future inflation? Because there's a whole dialogue out, there's a whole discussion. You almost can't, uh, you can read almost every day a forecast that's saying hyperinflation is in our future, or you know, fast and rising inflation. So the first thing to say about, um, so let me, let me talk about that. So right now, um, the Federal Reserve in its last statement in December said that it's gonna keep rates low, um, at least until the unemployment rate falls uh, below 6.5%, unless uh, the medium term outlook for inflation were to arise above 2.5%. And what is the medium term? Medium term is between one to two years. Okay. So um, basically the inflation rate, I think right now, the inflation rate over the year 2014 would be about, would be about that. So that's what you're looking, you want to, it's because of the lags associated with the operation of monetary policy. You don't want to be looking at inflation next month because you can't do anything about it. And so if, 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 if people here or listening to this, is it a good proxy to be looking at treasury inflation protected securities as, well, that's that's a good, which right now is around two and a half percent. I think it's in that it's in that range uh, for 10 year uh, tips. They want to kind of be thinking about this medium term. So that's a good question. I mean, uh, we certainly look at those measures. Those measures have uh, what, we, what, are, what we call risk premia associated with them as well. So they're, they're, they're gonna be higher always than the average because of that. Um, I would look at professional forecasters, frankly, as being one way to get a measure of that, what they're looking at. And I certainly think you should look at the Fed's own forecast. I think the, the, we're very good. Um, so those those are the... So I, I, let me take the, the question in two pieces. So one uh, thing you'll hear is that, boy, we already have a lot of inflation. And um, I just showed a chart that said, no, we don't have a lot of inflation. And I, I think what that comes from, that, that, that thinking comes from is, is actually... Um, people have, it actually comes from economic theory. Um, it's very interesting. It, the Fed has created a lot of, has bought a lot of long-term securities from the government. And it's done that by um, um, taking in deposits, essentially, from banks around the, the country. That's how it funds the purchases of its, uh, its, uh, these long-term securities, is by taking in deposits. These are the so-called bank reserves. And those are, are like money in a lot of ways. Um, so people are, look at the Fed, boy, they've created a lot of money. There's got to be inflation somewhere down the road. So right now, though, I just showed you, there hasn't been a lot of inflation. And I think when people, people look at the inflation, I think it's very important to, take two, to keep in mind two perspectives. One is that you don't want to be looking over too short a horizon. So sometimes when you look at gas prices, they're going up really fast. But look over a longer horizon. Look over, say, the last five years. So I, I just put gas in my car this week. Put gas in my car this week, I paid $3 a gallon for that gas. If I'd filled that, ga that tank of gas uh, five years ago, I would have paid $3 a gallon. So that means that five-year average inflation rate of 1.7%, gasoline is actually pushing us downward on that. But certainly, there are going to be months or uh, even you know, quarters where gasoline is going to rise very rapidly. And, and what happens is, I think if people think there's got to be inflation, you can always find some good somewhere that's, that's going up. And so you also want to be taking a broad enough perspective. So I think you always want to be keeping a perspective long enough and broad enough in terms of what goods you're uh, taking, looking at a broad range of goods. And also, uh, if you are looking at goods, you want to be looking over a long enough, long enough horizon. What about the future, though? This is all about the past. Surely inflation must come at some point if the, if the Fed has this much money. And this is really, uh, actually really one of the reasons it's really interesting to be working at the Federal Reserve right now is uh, there's been a big change in the tools of our disposal, which mean that we can have a very big balance sheet. We can have a lot of reserves in, in the banking system without it causing inflation. And the key to that is we can pay interest on those reserves. So in, the, in October 2008, the, the, um, the Congress uh, gave the Fed the power to pay interest on the deposits, essentially. The, the Fed is like a big bank, and, and all of the banks around the country have deposits with the Fed. The Fed now can pay interest on those deposits. By varying that interest, it can, 
it can influence the willingness of those banks to make loans based on those deposits. By doing that, we now have the ability to control inflationary pressures, even if we have a very large balance sheet. But one of the things that really strikes me is that we're, are we a little bit uh, in an unprecedented situation? Because it's not just the Fed that has been doing extraordinary actions. It's the European Central Bank. It's the Swiss Central Bank. It's the British Central Bank. I mean, everybody has been uh, creating a new toolkit. And they're all, to some extent, in this global economy, you all may be trying to do the same thing at the same time. I mean, what about the challenges of doing, of avoiding inflation in this global economy that we have? Yeah, that's, that's a good question, although I think the, in the, the U.S. context, um, I, you know, I, I, tr certainly trade is more important than it used to be, but we're still pretty much, a, uh, I think of as being uh, very much a closed economy. So I think of Fed policy as really being pretty much determinative for what the path of inflation is going to be. Yeah. So then, uh, next question, which you'd mentioned um, the 5.5% unemployment rate. And uh, there's two parts. So I think it's, it's, it's intriguing. What do you believe constitutes full employment in the current economic landscape? And then this part I find extremely intriguing is, is it ever possible for full employment to be a negative unemployment rate. In other words, too much work to be done and not enough people to do it. Um, so, uh, so let me see. So what do I constitute full employment? Let me take the easy question first. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what constitutes full employment? So I, 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 try, I gave a little bit of an answer to that earlier, which is that um, the, the, uh, the FOMC uh, has provides forecasts of where they think the unemployment rate will converge to in the long run. So that's five, over, within the next five to six years. Um, uh, uh, while inflation stays at 2%. And that unemployment rate that we see is somewhere between 5.2 and 6%. So I would say, in answer to this question, you know, different economists would define full employment differently. But I think somewhere in that range of 5.2 to 6% is what we should be thinking about is Inflation is going to, uh, unemployment is going to fall to uh, under appropriate monetary policy. Okay, before we get to the next part, then yes, uh, let me break it up a little bit. In the in the in the fifties and sixties, even in the seventies, there was a lot of discussion about full employment that we would get the unemployment rate down to somewhere between one and three percent, and that then would reflect, you know, people say goodbye to the boss, they want to leave their job, they want to, you know, things yeah. come along, they get sick, but there really was a belief that you could get toward full employment. And to a large extent, I think that discussion has been lost. Can we actually get down to an employment rate of two, three percent? Well, I think that the the tension that exists with that is, um, you know, what kind of uh, inflation rate do you want to have with that? And um, from the Fed's point of view, um, we we think about as being maximum employment is the unemployment rate that coexists over the longer run with the Inflation target we're trying to hit. And so if we want to get 2% over the longer run for inflation, what's the unemployment rate that, that lives with that? And our estimate of that right now is not 2 to 3%. It's more on the order of 5.2 to 6%. And that's what we see as being, um, so it's, people sometimes use the term frictional, but it's basically what you're talking about, just the moving of between jobs and uh, that, that's part of the, 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 the uh, natural give and take in, a, in an economy. And so now I think you have to put on your professor's hat at this point. Uh, can there be such a thing as a negative unemployment rate? So the, the, the way the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, measures unemployment is that surveys households on a, on a monthly basis and it asks them, uh, do you have a job? And if you don't have a job, uh, have you looked for one in the last four weeks? And they sum those together and that's called the labor force. If you go look for have a job or have looked for one in the last four weeks, that's put together, it's called the labor force. And then uh, the fraction of people who have, of that, the fraction of people who, have, who don't have a job, the ones who have looked for a job in the last four weeks, are what are called the unemployed. So definitionally, it cannot be negative. But <laughs> So that's the, uh, the easy way to answer the question. The, the, the right way to answer the question is there are definitely points in time in, um, in I would say, probably more regional than nationally, where you see very low unemployment, um, and I, I uh, so so our bank uh, has spent a lot of time uh, uh, digging into what's going on in the Bakken, which is Western North Dakota and Eastern Montana, 
having a huge oil boom. And there are uh, parts of that, uh, that uh, region of North Dakota and Montana where the unemployment rate is falling into the low ones. So what happens then is basically um, you know, huge wage pressures, really signs of what I would call a labor shortage is taking place. Uh, so you don't see negative unemployment, but boy, unemployment gets really low. And, it's, it, and you'll see uh, things you're not seeing in the United States right now as a whole by any means. You're going to start to see wages bid up to very high levels for, for all kinds of jobs, not just you know, computer scientists. And that. So the next question for the audience, I think, is uh, kind of hit on a discussion that's going to be happening over the next five, several years anyway. Um, how does the current Fed program of quantitative easing you know, the various QEs, uh, differ from what uh, Chairman McKesney Martin once referred to as monetizing the debt. And more recently, there was a book written by um, William Sober, economist at New York University, where he argued that Paul Volcker, who did the legendary central banker, head of the central bank, the real genius of Paul Volcker wasn't on monetary policy, but that he refused to monetize the debt. And that's why we really had this from Volcker's reign, uh, we had this downward spiral in the inflation rate, the era of disinflation. You know, so I think of the Fed um, in buying, the open market operations always they take the same form. The exchange reserves for, for, for uh, government issued or government backed securities. Um, we just, we're doing a lot of it, I admit, but, but it's very similar to what, what the business as usual. You know, a different economists will use the term monetize the debt, which really has, you know, it sounds it's, bad. It sounds bad. It really does. So, so, yeah. so people use it in different ways. I'll tell you how I, uh, how I would, th I think about it. And that is that a, a person buying U.S. government debt has in mind a certain rate of inflation when they buy that government debt. That, 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 that debt, you know, if they're not buying tips, if they're buying regular, uh, treasuries, that debt is promising them dollars in the future. And they have in mind some amount of money those dollars are going to be able to buy. As, some amount of money. Some amount of goods that, 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 that those dollars are going to be able to buy. They have some, some mind some rate of inflation. As long as we continue to hit that 2% inflation, we're not monetizing the debt because we're not making that debt cheaper in any way for the government to repay. So that's, I think, the, the right, in my view, the right definition of monetizing is whether or not we are making the debt cheaper than um, uh, for making it easier for the government to repay by making the inflation rate higher than than two percent, and we're not doing that. In fact, you know, quite the contrary, I would say. So, what's it like when you're at a federal open market committee meeting? I mean, are you having discussions like we're having right now, or do you uh, take out the cards, play a little poker, uh, <laughs> figure you know we got to we got to get through this 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 meeting, and then we got to do some minutes? And what's it like? Uh, it's it's all about the cards, actually. <laughs> You know, the chairman especially is very good. No. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an amazing room, first of all. It's, uh, it's a huge table. I think people described it as being something like 27 feet long or something like that. Um, and we're all seated around it along with staff. And we all sit in the same place every meeting. So I have my, my uh, location. It's not a bad location. So I'm at the, it's an oval table. And I'm at one end of the oval, a little bit off to the side. I sort of get squeezed, I would say, occasionally. <laughs> um, and not that I'm criticizing anybody, but um, but it's it's so we all sit in the same place. And uh, then what happens is that there'll be a staff presentations about what's going on in the economy, and then each of the presidents and each of the governors will speak about their perspectives in the economy. Um, the presidents usually talk. Uh, for some time about what's going on in their local economy. So that's part of the reason that we would have the president as the meetings is to bring that local color to bear on what's going on. Um, you know, and and uh, so I was able to tell my colleagues that you know if they ever wanted to to quit their day jobs, they could head out to North Dakota and make some real money uh, <laughs> in the oil fields. Um, the the uh, so that's the first round. Then. Um, so we, there will be a discussion of the various policy options that are on the table at that time. And of course, you know, anything can happen, but generally we have in mind um, a, a, a limited set of options that will be on the table at any given point in time. 
And again, we each each talk in turn about about what's what what the about what our perspectives on those options. So there's really, um, in general, I, so there's not a lot of give and take in the context of a meeting. So it's not like a debating society. There's a little bit, but not very much. Uh, I think Chairman Bernanke introduced when he first became chairman his idea of what he called a two-handed intervention, which meant that you could. Um, you put up both your hands, that meant that you would be able to intervene outside your turn and speak out of turn and say something about what somebody else had said. Uh, but that happens relatively infrequently, I would say. I think the, the chairman was trying to aim for more give and take than, but I personally, I'm I like the, the slow motion give and take. What I mean by slow motion give and take is I'll say something in a meeting and people might not respond to it immediately, but when we come back six to seven weeks, they'll all have said, my staff worked on what President Coach Lakota said. And uh, and sometimes they say that he was right on, but often, <laughs> you know, not so much. Um, the flavor of the discourse, I will say, is, is very technical. You know, it's about what's going on in the economy. What's, what are the inflationary pressures like? What are the unemployment pressures like? And that's what the conversation is about. It's very... Uh, you know, sometimes I, I use the word technocratic. You can say wonky or nerdy. That's the that's the flavor of the conversation that takes place. Well, so if you ever you know go to a meeting in 2013, you ever think in the back of your mind that in five years the minutes of this meeting are going to be released and whatever I said, whatever forecast I made, whatever point I made, at least scholars are going to be looking at this. I I, I don't think about it, and probably you know uh, maybe I should be, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I actually never never do think about that. So here's, uh, I think, the, the last, past couple of years outside of the, the job market, labor market, the housing market has been an important yeah. topic. And um, this question is, you know, housing starts seem to be slowly but steadily increasing. Do you think that the Federal Reserve Bank should make policy changes for members' banks to support this recovery? Or do you think that uh, financing the recovery with a asset purchases, this would be the mortgage-backed securities, uh, is that sufficient? And just explain briefly about the, uh, the, uh, the, the policy of asset purchases. Yeah, so I'll talk a little about the policy of asset purchases. Uh, the Federal Reserve is um, buying long-term assets from the from the U.S. government um, over time, it's bought bought a lot already, and it's going to it's continue to buy long-term assets. Some of these are mortgage-backed securities that are uh, been been uh, issued by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which are now essentially owned by the government. And um, by buying these, so what is a mortgage-backed security? What does that even mean? Uh, it's sort of got a negative connotation in the seems so positive in the 2005, and then got a negative connotation in 2008. Um, so the, 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 a mortgage-backed security is essentially Fannie Mae and, and Freddie Mac are buying up mortgages from banks that have originated those mortgages, to people like you and me, and then uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac will pool those together into uh, one security that can then be bought. The, the key to it is that the purchaser of the, the, the mortgage-backed security doesn't face any credit risk. And what that means is if there's defaults on the, on the mortgages, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are still on the hook to make good on those, on the, uh, on those mortgages. So the Fed, in buying these mortgage-backed securities, doesn't face any credit risk in associated with those purchases. There is risk associated with what's called prepayment risk, which is that if interest rates fall and everyone starts to uh, want to refinance, these will get uh, uh, paid uh, earlier than you might otherwise think. On the other hand, if uh, interest rates rise, then it's going to take longer to, for them to be, 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 be prepaid. So all of these purchases are going to be pushed upwards on mortgage-backed securities. That means that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are going to be willing to, and it's going to pass through Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac through to the banks into a lower mortgage rate for, for borrowers. So this is a way to provide support to, to the housing market and starting to see some good signs in housing. And, and, uh, you, uh, Chris mentioned the housing starts number. I think even more important is what's going on with values. So what's going on with housing prices? Because that, that's, I think, has really been a real a drag on the economy is that you know, without housing equity, people can't start small businesses. They can't spend on, and uh, uh, they can't borrow against their homes to, to finance spending. And they might be counting on their home as a source of, uh, of security for their retirement. If it's low in value, they don't feel that source of security and they, they don't feel like spending. So all these forces, I think, are, it's really important to see housing values go up, and we are starting to see that. I, you know, I, I think that the, uh, 
Um, the Federal Reserve System in, in formulating its, its regulations for banking is, as always, now this is done to be clear, uh, regulations are formed at the Board of Governors. We're sort of the implementers here at the, the Federal Reserve Bank level in, in Minneapolis. But you know, a lot of thought goes into weighing the costs and benefits of any regulation. The, the benefit is security and safety, yeah. that you don't want to have risks to banks. Um, the, the, the cost of regulation is it puts drags on the, 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 this, on the process of financing small businesses, of, of financing uh, home ownership. But, you know, that, that's the, those are the costs and benefits that are always getting weighed constantly on a, a, when regulations are set. Yeah. And then um, you've, you've kind of addressed this one, but I think this has kind of an interesting twist that given that Chairman Bernanke's monetary policy seems to be unleashing inflation, do you anticipate a recovery in the economy? And I, I do, there is a strand of conversation out there that we're going to see inflation and the Fed's going to have to respond to inflation. So this sort of 2% world that we're living in, we may be in there for a long time or even worse because of this unleashed inflation. I, I mean, sorry, 2% world? I didn't know what you know about 2% world. Well, that, so the economy is starting to grow, but if inflation grows faster, the Fed is going to have to respond to that inflation, and the economy doesn't, oh, 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 isn't I see, allowed I see, I see. to get to its normal trajectory. I see, I see. So I, uh, for, okay, so I'll start with a couple of things, uh, points. So as I, I talked about a little bit earlier, the Fed has the power and has the will to keep inflation at target. And the, the tools we have at our disposal, uh, the first one we'd be using is to raise the interest rate on reserves when banks, what's going to happen is the economy starts to recover, banks are going to see more lending opportunities, they're going to want to make more loans. Uh, that will push upward on prices. But let's back up. When I think a, a key question for, for the economy is going to be how big is, uh, I talked about there being a 9% gap between where we are now and where we would have expected to be in 2007. And the question is going to be, when will we see inflationary pressures as we start to make up that gap, if we do? Uh, that is, if we start to grow faster than 2% or 2.5, we'll start to make up that, that gap. And we will, uh, will we start to see inflationary pressures immediately? I, I, my own answer to that is, is no, and that's the answer of the FOMC as well, that as long as we see unemployment as high as we see it now, as long as we see unemployment as uh, being above... Uh, I would say even at, at the level of 5.5%, we will not be seeing inflation well above our target. So we will not be forced to respond. So I think that's the, 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 I, I think the premise of the question is not one that's shared by the FOMC, that we forecast that unemployment can come down considerably before we start to see inflationary pressures such that we would have to, have to respond in an aggressive fashion. Well, I think that's a good note to end on because I've just been given the uh, the sign, the hook. And uh, so we have- This was uh, so much fun. Yeah, I but know. Are, this is, we could keep going. There but, are cookies, but, uh, aren't there? Oh, okay. There are cookies. So. There is a reception outside. <laughs> so, so please go out there. And I'd like to thank you, the audience, for coming to tonight's conversation with the Fed. And I'd like to thank Narayana Kocha Lakota for taking the questions. And- um, I'll take the liberty of saying that I speak for both of us where we're particularly glad about your questions. So oh, yeah. I you. thought the questions were outstanding. I was really, they were great. So it was a good audience. So, food. <laughs> <laughs>